Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for August 26, 2022. Uh, I'm going to start by just reviewing the process by which Malthusian green fascists are pushing Europe into a new dark age. The green policies are being enforced by a combination of the U.S. government, U.K. government, NATO, the European Union, through supranational agreements and enforced by NATO and by central bankers who control credit. They've been unleashing hyperinflation at the same time they're creating energy shortages and they're driving energy costs through the roof and increasing poverty throughout the continent in the so-called advanced sector world. Now we're seeing gas prices set by speculators in the Dutch spot markets are up 600% in this last year. In the United Kingdom, the term fuel poverty is now becoming commonly discussed as conditions are hitting hard, especially impoverished pensioners, but also the former middle class who can't keep up with the spiraling of costs, especially the forecast that inflation will go up 18% in the United Kingdom by the end of this year. There are 20 million American homes that are behind in utility bills and face the possibility of power cutoffs as winter is approaching. And major corporations in Germany are facing bankruptcy because of energy costs, and some are shutting down. What, meanwhile, farm protests in Germany are scheduled now to begin on August 31st. So we have a very serious overall economic crisis hitting Europe and the United States. Now, I want to give you just a few other headlines quickly. <clears throat> Boris Johnson uh, was in Kyiv yesterday. Apparently, he knows he's more popular among the Ukrainian neo-fascists than he is under the population in the United Kingdom, where he's been driven out of office. Uh, he promised that Britain would support the Ukrainians until they win the war. Macron, the French president, is in Algeria, essentially to beg for natural gas and forgiveness for comments he's made belittling the people of Algeria. And meanwhile, German Chancellor Schultz is pledging an open-ended arms flow from Germany into Ukraine, obviously because he and other governments in uh, NATO believe this war is going to continue as the new endless war. Now, let me call your attention to the uh, upcoming issue of the Executive Intelligence Review under the headline, The, war, the World Needs Gandhi's Nonviolent Direct Action. This features Helga Zeplerush's speech made to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Indian independence from Great Britain. It also includes a very important article by Lyndon LaRouche from August 2010, uh, which addresses the crisis that we're facing now. The article is entitled, The Economic Past is Behind Us, Money or Credit. Now, this is especially pertinent given the opening yesterday of the Federal Reserve's Jackson Hole, Wyoming conclave. Uh, Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman, will be addressing it today, giving a speech on the economic outlook. What most people expect is more rate hikes uh, until inflation comes down. I would recommend to Jerome Powell that he read LaRouche's article to learn the difference between money and credit, because the question of interest rates itself is not the solution to this crisis. You have to move toward a credit policy, which ensures there'll be credit available where it's needed, namely in the productive sector. Now it's Friday, so I'm gonna to turn to your questions. I, I, I wanna thank the viewers because I was overwhelmed by the number of good, serious questions, some of which I just can't answer in, in uh, a short broadcast, like one in particular about the Plato's allegory of the caves, shadows in the caves, which is an appropriate allegory for what we face today with the media control. Let me answer that by taking up a, another question, which is what is Bellingcat and can it be trusted? Bellingcat is a so-called open source uh, investigative arm, but an arm of what? Public opinion shaping? Who funds it? 
It's funded by the U.S. government's National Endowment for Democracy, which is a regime change coup funding operation by the European Union with con direct connections to the British Foreign Office and to military industrial complex firms. So what's its purpose? Its purpose is to impose groupthink, to impose a narrative. And it's been exposed by the gray zone, by Mike Robinson of the UK column. Uh, and we're gonna be doing some more work at the executive intelligence on how this narrative control is run. But let me just call your attention to something I learned from Mike Robinson the other day. In the United Kingdom, there's an operation, an agency titled the Behavioral Insight Team, which is a government agency whose purpose is to figure out how to change behavior through manipulation of the narrative. This goes back to the uh, studies that have been done on how do you manipulate a population to keep them complacent and uh, non-rebellious when policies are being implemented against their interests which they don't like, but how do you keep them in the dark and confuse them? That's why I say this is the, the Plato's analogy of the cave, shadows in the cave, is very appropriate for looking at this situation. So Bellingcat, can you trust them? Absolutely not. It's an agency whose purpose is to support the intentions of the military industrial complex to continue globalization, to continue endless wars, regime change, and attacks on any nation or any people that seek to establish sovereign relations with other nations and should be seen as, as precisely that, a government narrative control agency. Now, I received many questions related to what, what one can do to protect their savings, their financial situation for themselves and their families in these precarious times. What, what would be an investment strategy? And related to this, when will the crash occur? Now, in the last question, no one can tell for sure when a crash will occur. There's a psychological moment when everyone recognizes that we've gone over the cliff. It's like the classic Roadrunner Wiley Coyote cartoon, where the coyote runs over the cliff, and only when he looks down does he realize that he's going straight down. That's where we are today. We, we face uh, default on debt, huge volumes of debt. The financial system is backed by nothing, nothing, especially uh, the Western financial system. And there are moves away from that by much of the world. Uh, so the, the question of when the actual crash will occur is it's undetermined. It could be any time now. But the more important question to get to this question of what can you do to protect yourself we're not financial advisors. We provide an analysis based on Lyndon LaRouche's Riemannian method of looking at the physical economy and the overall dynamic, the relationship between credit and production, the relationship between creative innovation and improvements in physical economy. Now, what I can tell you is that there's not much you can do to save your future when we're facing a systemic crash. What you need to do is fight for a solution for everyone. And this starts with fighting for LaRouche's four laws, the return to regulated banking with Glass-Steagall, which would mean that there will be no more bailouts for speculators because you'll be separating the investment banks from the commercial banks. That's the first law. Secondly, a credit policy, a Hamiltonian credit policy, instead of a privately owned central bank like the Federal Reserve in which credit policy is determined by the needs of the nation and the uh, volume of funds are directed not to speculators, but to producers, to scientists, to engineers, to research and development that will add to the overall productivity of the economy as opposed to the accumulation of debt. The third point then is investment in infrastructure because infrastructure improvements, moving to new stages or new platforms of infrastructure, cheapens the overall cost of production and therefore increases productivity. And then directly related that, to that is the fourth law, investment in the future, in the frontiers of science and technology. And at this point in time, this includes nuclear fusion, 
and related plasma technologies, and especially space exploration. To do that, you have to break completely with neoliberal economic policy, which essentially is based on the idea of a free and open market, which doesn't exist because the largest collection of uh, power is in the hands of those who control the largest amounts of money, like BlackRock, like Vanguard, like J.P. Morgan Chase, like Barclays, the largest financial institutions that dictate policy through governments, especially through their control over central banks. Unless we break with that, you have no financial future. Whatever money you have in the bank is in a very uh, precarious situation. We need economic changes at the top. It can happen. It can happen especially when people figure out that the reason they're going to be cold and hungry this winter is because of the failed policies of the existing financial establishment, the corporate cartels, the bankers, and so on. Now, several people ask related to this, what about Biden's action canceling some student debt? Won't this fuel inflation? Well, inflation is caused by the trillions of dollars of funny money that's been pumped into the system by the central banks. The little bit that's going to be canceled by the Biden student loan program uh, is not going to have a substantial effect on the value of money. But other people are saying, well, isn't it unfair for the families that paid for their children's tuition that others are getting off free? Well, there's a certain unfairness to that, but you have to face the fact that you can't punish people who are trying to better themselves through education who don't have money and can't afford to pay for college. You want to talk about fairness? What is it that has driven up the costs of a college education so much at the same time that the actual value of that education, both in terms of job potential in the future, as well as improving the creative capacities of students, uh, is so uh, there's such a gap. As the costs go up, the quality of education has dropped. So I think the question we have to ask is, what is it that's driving this high, uh, just unbelievable cost of education, where some of the Eastern elite colleges now cost sixty or seventy thousand dollars per year? Now, this has to do with the overall collapse of physical economy and the fact that you have a, a very significant pipeline from these special universities to the military industrial complex, to the establishment and so on. But, but this is the, the question I think you have to look at when you want to take up what's unfair about our current system. Now, the next question is, uh, are there scientists who dispute man-made climate change? Uh, and, and I had several people asking this because I brought it up earlier in the week. Now, the, the best thing I can do is refer you to something called CLINTEL, Climate Intelligence. It's a group of over a thousand scientists who put out a statement earlier this year or last year, quote, there is no climate emergency, unquote. And they're dismissed by the media which is pushing the fake science of man-made climate change, they're dismissed as climate skeptics or climate deniers. Well, these include Nobel laureates, physicists, chemists, uh, actual climate scientists, as opposed to people like Bill McKibben, who's a fraudulent climate expert whose degree is in journalism. He, doesn't, he wouldn't know a scientific process if it hit him in the face. So... The Clintel put out a statement saying climate science should be less political, while climate policies should be more scientific. And they've issued a call for open debate. Do you think the scaremongers who used Greta Thunberg to hammer governments into adopting these fraudulent policies, do you think they're willing to have an open debate? No, they openly say the debate is over. Well, in science, the debate is never over. You must always be open to anomalies which appear in what you think is proven science. And the fact that they won't debate, that they won't accept the idea that they're imposing a political economic agenda in the name of science ought to prove to you that the current uh, ideology around climate is a fraudulent 
cover for reducing population, for economic measures that uh, increase the power of the wealthy and, and so on. Now, there was also a climate, um, uh, this, there's, there is no climate emergency, a petition to the UN General Secretary. Uh, there are over a thousand scientists in Italy who have signed this. So the debate should be going on. The fact that it's suppressed shows the degree to which narratives are, narratives are controlled by the people who have political power and financial power to do so. Now, finally, I take a, a question from a, a younger friend of mine who asked, how do you protect young people who still are curious and want to learn? Uh, how do you inspire them? And I think this is an important question, and it, it, it's much longer than, than I can, uh, the answer is much longer than I can give you at the end of this discussion today. But the most important thing is to expose them as much as possible to classical culture, both in terms of music, in terms of drama, poetry. Uh, look at history from the standpoint of tragedy. This is something that Lyndon LaRouche has always emphasized and, and really hit me more than almost anything else I learned from him, that you must allow the imagination to have free reign. And what I mean by that is that the, most of the discoveries in science come from the mind of the scientist, the intuition, the development of their mind over time so that they can make hypotheses that go beyond what you see or hear or experience with the senses. And the control of science has been done by those who are empiricists who say that the only thing that's real is what you can touch or feel or smell or hear. And so the ability to allow for that kind of free reign of imagination and have an education system which develops critical thinkers based on investigating the great discoveries and ideas of the past. Once young people get to see the difference between a narrative which says you're going to freeze to death or burn up because of man-made climate change without presenting any truthful evidence, once people begin to see that they're being manipulated, then you create the opening for the mind to explore in a way that's healthy. In fact, it's the only healthy way that, that human beings can survive. Now, I'm going to ask you finally to register for our upcoming Schiller Institute conference, which will be reviewing the lifetime work of Lyndon LaRouche. The link will be at the bottom of the description section of today's update. And this will be September 10th and 11th, an online conference. If you have any interest in what we've been discussing, sign up for this conference and sign up others so that we can begin to expand this dialogue to the broader population. And thanks for joining me this week. I'll be back again on Monday.